Ah, yes. The original Alexander Courage performed theme to Star Trek here on That Modern Rock Show. And our guest tonight joined the cast of Star Trek in 1967 and stayed with the sci-fi franchise until 1994's Generations film. Of course, as an actor, he's best known for his role on Star Trek as Pavel Chekhov. But there's also another sci-fi series that our guest was a part of, Babylon 5, where he played the sinister Alfred Bester. Walter Koenig joins us tonight, and I have to ask, and you probably get this all the time, but of these two famous roles of yours, which is your favorite? Well, I certainly have enormous gratitude uh, for what Star Trek has um, brought, to, brought to me and, and how it has shaped my life. And, uh, and I will always have, a, you know, an, an inordinate amount of affection for that whole, uh, for that whole relationship. However, if it comes to you know the aesthetics of, of, of acting and what was the more creative challenge, I, I, I feel quite confident that best there was. Uh, you know, the, the stories when, whenever Bester appeared, he was pretty much central to the story, and uh, and his character grew. There was dimensionality to his character, um, and so it was it was it was a challenge to play and. Uh, and an exciting one. So, uh, although Chekhov is, you know, in my heart, uh, so uh, so in another way is, is Babylon Five and, and Bester. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you went from one extreme to the other with those two characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's what an actor's supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. He was sort of the the happy go lucky uh, young. Chekhov, and then probably the most evil man in the universe. <laughs> well, I want to point out to my audience that uh, not only are you, a, of course, a, a famous actor, but also you're a well-respected writer. In fact, you've got a new graphic novel coming out called Things to Come, and I should point out for our listeners here that this is not a, an adaptation of the famous H.G. Wells' Things to Come. That's totally correct. Right. Tell us a little bit about uh, this project and how you became involved. Well, let me first say that it, although it has absolutely nothing to do with H.G. Wells' story, uh, I, I did purloin the title. I, as, but I, 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 euphemistically, I, I think of it in terms of paying homage as opposed to stealing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, how I got became involved, well... I've, I've discovered long ago that um, most of uh, my career they, uh, has been uh, self-motivating, um, and when I haven't uh, when I haven't had any luck, it's it's because of a lack thereof. And um, I was sitting at home and th- thinking about a story. I don't read comic books very much, and uh, I really don't know what's what's current. And I actually had the temerity to think that um, a story about apocalyptic va- vampires was new. <laughs> 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 Evidently, it isn't. However, um, I think my take is, and in any case, I decided to um, write a screenplay. And, and I've written screenplays in the past. I've actually had uh, one project um, uh, produced, a feature film produced. I used to write for television back in the 70s. <clears throat> oh, sure. So um, I sat down and I started doing an outline uh, of, of this story. And I don't know, uh, maybe 40% of the way through, it occurred to me that it, it is perhaps not true that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. In other words, um, writing it and then getting it to an agent or even to a producer, uh, might be a very long, uh, in, you know, involved process. Right. Whereas if I wrote it as a comic book, I have present, what I have is, is um, something very visual that can serve as a storyboard. And if anybody's interested um, in making it into film thereafter, they have a... Uh, a good idea what I had in mind, and then once I started writing as a comic book, I you know I I, I I've written a few comics in the past, and I and I discovered once again, or I I rediscovered that 
it's a fun process, and it's it's enjoyable, and that the um, it it truly an end unto itself, as opposed to a means to an end. So, um, having uh, uh, reached out to a couple of publishers and gotten one to agree, I proceeded to uh, write the story. And very soon after I had begun writing it, I was approached. Uh, by a wonderful artist named Juan Carlos Baez. And uh, we, uh, he showed me his work, and I thought he was great. And I, I, turned, I, I told my publisher about his work, and they got along, and they made a deal. So we, we really did this together. It's very much a, um, very much a joint effort. And uh, his work, I think, is quite brilliant. And uh, I hope a lot of recognition. I mean, he's a professional, and he's done, you know, professional work before, but I hope he gets a great deal of recognition on the basis of what he did for things to come. But certainly you're no stranger to comic books because you had your own series, uh, Raver. That's right. Back in the 90s, I, I pitched an idea for a superhero to Malibu Comics, and they, and they uh, we came to an agreement, and I did three issues of, of uh, a character called Raver. Now, what this publishing company wants to do, it's Blue Water Productions. But in addition to, in addition to, to putting, uh, to bundling the four issues of Things to Come together and making it into a graphic novel, they wanted me to write another, edition, another um, issue of Raver, thinking that a lot of people um, have been reading comic books since the 90s. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But not necessarily are familiar with that story. So they asked me to write a, a fourth issue, and they could bundle that as well. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at two graphic novels, and hopefully uh, we'll get some very nice reaction. Of course, Things to Come is Vampires and the Apocalypse, so sort of a science fiction slash horror and uh, you've written for television, uh, you wrote for Land of the Lost and uh, The Powers of Matthew Starr, also Star Trek, the animated series. So you've worked in the in the genre of science fiction for quite a long time. I, I'm just curious, were you a fan of science fiction growing up, or did you become a fan later after working on Star Trek? No, I didn't always have an interest. You know, uh, you, have to, you have to decide, um, even in something as... Um, as aesthetic as writing, writing stories, you have to still determine where your market is and uh, where, what would be most accessible. And because I've been identified with Star Trek and science fiction in general, uh, uh, that market is more receptive to me and the more curious and more uh, likely uh, to take a look at what I have in mind. So, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it, was a, it was a very pragmatic move on my part to focus uh, on uh, science fiction. That isn't to say that I, in, in, in the interim, I haven't done other things as well. I, I, I just, uh, I wrote a, a seven and a half minute film that I just produced um, that has nothing to do with science fiction, um, has to do with, it has to do with handball. Well, handball is the background, it's, it's about a guy and his conscience and the, uh, the suffering that he's gone through in the last 20 years. Well, let me ask you, when you sit down to write a uh, science fiction story, do you find that you have more freedom in that genre, or, or is it more limiting in a way? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think writing science fiction is, is limiting in one degree, in, in, one, in one aspect. You need to create... For the most part, you need to create a reality that is consistent. When you write contemporary stuff, you know, the, the reality is already there. We know that people get on buses. We know that uh, they uh, eat at, you know, at coffee shops. Uh, we know what, what the, the, the rules are in writing. It's, it's, all, it's all there. It's so we, you don't have to concern yourself with, is it logical? Um, is, the, is the environment logical? But when you write science fiction and you're you know, creating new worlds or, or uh, uh, different dimensions or whatever it might be, you have to really start from scratch and make sure that the, the, the story, the, the plot is, is consistent 
that, that the that where these pe- people or beings or entities coming from uh, that they have a, a credible origin and all of that. So uh, I think it's a little harder in some cases to write science fiction. Hmm. You know, uh, we mentioned your uh, TV writing, and you stopped for a while, and is that because of the uh, Star Trek motion picture series? No, I stopped writing for television because I, 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 just, couldn't, I just couldn't deal with it. Um, I, sold, I, I sold three or four uh, scripts to different shows, or, uh, and uh, by the time that the, 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 they had finished rewriting them, um, I, they were unrecognizable. I mean, I, I just, I just uh, uh, didn't see any of my work, and even though I got credit and I got the money, and I was as written by, it just had very little to do with my, with the germinating idea that I had when I sat down to create the story, and I, just you know, just, and and perhaps one could go on that way, and be philosophical about it, and say, well, you know. It's a living, but that also defines that also defines a hack for me. Right. And uh, I, I I I chose to write when the acting uh, kind of dried up because I thought it was something that I I could be creative and I could enjoy. And if I if, if what I'm doing is um, is not uh, an evidence at at the end of the day, then it's it's no longer fun for me, even though I, you know they slap some money in my hand. <laughs> I should tell the audience that if you've just joined us, we're talking to Walter Koenig, uh, famous, of course, for his roles as Chekhov on Star Trek and Alfred Bester on Babylon 5, and, of course, an author not only of uh, fiction but his own autobiography, Warped Factors, and several books of that ilk. And he's got a new graphic novel coming out June 1st, called Things to Come, and I'm assuming that that's going to be available at your local bookstore or Amazon.com? Yeah, certainly in Amazon.com. Um, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, we thought we were going to get the book done earlier, and uh, Barnes & Noble had set up a, uh, an afternoon for me to come in and autograph copies. Now, that was when we had, when we had it uh, going back several months. Uh, it didn't work out, so I, I don't know if, if that invitation is still available uh, on the table. But if it is, uh, then it, it certainly should be available at places like Barnes & Noble as well. Right. And I have to mention, uh, as, as we wrap this up here, that uh, you are getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame this year. Yeah, that's, that's the plan. <laughs> well, I don't think it'll change. <laughs> well, there is there is a uh, you know there is a uh, a problem with uh, with the, the financing of that. You know, uh, the, when, the first time I was in, in um, uh, people tried to rally around my getting a star was back I think in the nineties, and um, it was three thousand dollars. You know, to, right to to get it done, and, and now it's. As of this year, it's thirty thousand dollars. Whoa, that's inflation. Yeah, and um, and and whereas people before me have had um, groups and um, I don't know organized supporters um, and and institutions uh, helping make that happen. In this case, I'm solely dependent on the fans. Now that's that's a neat way to get it if if in fact uh, it, it happens. I mean, I, I I can't think of a better way than having the people who watch you, uh, you know, uh, make make this happen because it's really you know it's really for them that I, I've done all this you know this work right uh, over the years. But you know, it's there are so, there are so many more viable and more important causes, uh, you know. One could contribute to that. It's uh, I'm, you know I'm re- I'm very reluctant to uh, you know to get out there and um, and uh, beat the bushes. You know it's it, it has to come on, on its own. And uh, right now um, it's it's quite slow. 
we'll see. We'll see. Well, I certainly hope it happens. I mean, uh, I would think there'd be enough, certainly Star Trek fans and uh, Babylon 5 fans, uh, yeah. to make that happen for you. Yep, well, that's, that's, that's the hope. <laughs> well, I want, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming on and, and talking with us. Again, the graphic novel, Things to Come, June 1st. And there is a website, in fact, that you can visit for not only uh, information regarding that, but also uh, anything that Walter has uh, going on, if you want to uh, catch up with what uh, Walter's doing. And that's WalterKoenigSite.com. Is that that's correct? That is correct. All right. Well, thank you again. It's been great talking to you. Go see. It's been a pleasure. The Babylon Project was our last...